I'll be reviewing the use of lung ultrasound in the current COVID pandemic in this 30 minute lecture. Before I start, I have to mention my disclosures. I'm on the medical advisory board of Aquarius Mobile Health. Ultimately, I believe that ultrasound should be as readily available and accessible at the point of care to all clinicians as possible. We have four objectives to cover. I want you to develop a basic understanding and approach to lung ultrasound. We'll review typical lung ultrasound findings in COVID. We need to ensure that we use appropriate infection control measures to prevent the ultrasound machine from becoming a possible vector for an infection. And lastly, we'll try to establish how to apply lung ultrasound clinically in this current COVID pandemic. The current COVID pandemic is a global problem affecting every corner of the world. Lung ultrasound has come into prominence, not just in the medical world, but in the mainstream world and even the mainstream press. Here is Yale Tung Chen on CNN. He's an emergency physician in Madrid who has become famous for contracting COVID and posting daily ultrasound clips of his own lungs. Let's start with the basics. Lung ultrasound is not typically part of traditional diagnostic ultrasound, as the thinking has always been that ultrasound waves do not travel through air very well, therefore lung ultrasound is impossible. However, we have Daniel Lichtenstein to thank for his pioneering work on lung ultrasound, as he found that we can use the sonographic artifacts generated by scanning the lungs to determine normal versus pathology. So instead of seeing a direct ultrasound anatomic representation of the structure of interest, say like the heart, what we're seeing is an indirect representation of the lung, in the same way that an electrocardiogram provides an indirect representation of the heart. As such, ensure that you set your probe to a lung preset if it's available. Most newer machines have such a preset to optimize lung scanning. If your machine and probe do not have a lung preset, you will want to turn off all the filters and settings that optimize your image as we are trying to accentuate any ultrasound artifacts. You want to turn off compound imaging and tissue harmonics imaging. Your image may look grainier, but this is perfect for lung ultrasound. You can effectively use almost any probe to scan the lungs. A high-frequency linear probe is great for scanning the pleura because it's better at visualizing superficial structures, but it does poorly at looking deeper into the lung. A low-frequency curvilinear probe is effective at looking at both the pleura, provided you adjust your depth, as well as looking deeper into the lung. And finally, a low-frequency phased array probe is effective at visualizing deeper aspects of the lung, but it doesn't provide fantastic imaging of the pleura. However, it does have the versatility of being able to perform both cardiac imaging in addition to imaging of the lungs. There are different scanning techniques. For standard lung ultrasound, it is fine to use a simplified three-zone technique where you break up the chest into an anterior zone in blue, a lateral zone in yellow, and a posterior zone in red where you are trying to image as posterior laterally as possible. Anatomically speaking, the anterior zone corresponds to the upper lobe, the lateral zone corresponds to the middle lobe or lingula, and the posterior zone corresponds to the lower lobes. However, when it comes to scanning for pneumonia, and COVID specifically, you want to interrogate as much of the chest as possible. Our ultrasound scan is a two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional structure, so we want to cover as much of the lung as we can. I would recommend using a six-zone technique for each hemithorax, or 12 zones in total. We're going to use the anterior axillary line in white and the posterior axillary line in blue as our landmarks. These lines will divide the chest into the anterior, lateral, and posterior areas. Each area is subsequently divided into an upper and lower zone. So anteriorly, we have zones 1 and 2, laterally we have zones 3 and 4, and posteriorly we have zones 5 and 6. For a detailed demonstration of the scan, please refer to the following YouTube video. For each rib interspace, start by assessing the pleura. Set your depth with the pleural line mid-screen, and if you can adjust your focus, set it at the pleural line. Again, our landmarks are the ribs, which are hyperechoic with black shadowing. The pleural line is the hyperechoic bright white line in between the ribs that appears to be moving. This is normal sliding. It's often described as having a scintillating or shimmering appearance. Here again we see ribs, but this pleural line does not appear to be moving. This is an absence of sliding and suggests that the visceral and parietal pleura are not in contact with each other. Again, here's another example using the curvilinear probe. So we see ribs, and we see our bright white pleural line that does not seem to be moving. This should make you suspicious for the presence of a pneumothorax. However, you can also have absence of sliding if you're scanning over a large bulla or if the patient has had a mainstem intubation and there is an absence of ventilation in the lung that you're scanning. 
It's easy to see the difference when you compare normal sliding and absence sliding side by side. You may occasionally see this finding. Again, we start with the ribs as our landmark. Here, there's the presence of partial sliding in the pleural line, adjacent to the pleural line that is not sliding. This is called a lung point, and this is the most specific ultrasound finding of a pneumothorax. Essentially, this is the spot where the visceral and parietal pleura separate from each other. It's where the pneumothorax starts. Another pathologic finding to look for is subpleural consolidation, the presence of a hypoechoic area starting from the pleural line, outlined here in orange. These are usually small and can represent infection, most commonly viral pneumonia, but they can also appear with inflammation or pulmonary infarction. Next, look deeper in the lung. Here you want to adjust your depth to at least 14 to 16 centimeters. Normal lungs should appear to have multiple horizontal hyperechoic lines descending deeper into the screen. These are called eight lines and indicate normally aerated lung provided there is normal pleural sliding. Eight lines are a reverberation artifact. They develop because the pleural line is a strong reflector of ultrasound waves. As a result, the ultrasound wave is reflected back to the skin, then reflected back into the chest, then reflected back off the pleural line to the skin, and so on and so forth. The ultrasound machine interprets time as distance so the subsequent reflections are interpreted as coming from deeper and deeper in the tissue, so this is why the horizontal line repeats downwards on the screen. Let's start learning more about sonographic lung pathology. B lines are bright white vertical laser-like lines that start at the pleura and extend vertically all the way down the screen to at least 14 to 16 centimeters deep. They move with the movement of the pleural line and they obliterate A lines. B lines are an artifact that represent thickening of the interlobular septa and are a sonographic representation of alveolar interstitial syndrome. Here's another example of B-lines. The most common cause of B-lines is pulmonary edema, but they can also be caused by infection, pneumonitis, pulmonary hemorrhage, pulmonary fibrosis, interstitial lung disease, and ARDS. Patients are allowed to have an occasional isolated B-line in one or two lung zones, but having multiple B-lines in a single interspace is abnormal. When alveoli fill with fluid or are collapsed, you may see frank consolidation on lung ultrasound. It will result in a tissue-like density within the lung, and in this example, we see bright white areas within the tissue-like density. These bright white areas are air bronchograms and are suggestive of pneumonia more so than atelectasis. Here's another example. In this case, I've highlighted the diaphragm so we can orient ourselves. What we note is a tissue-like density above the diaphragm that looks like the liver. This is called hepatization. We know it's not the liver because it's above the diaphragm. The last sonographic finding to be familiar with is pleural effusion. Here we see a finding called the spine sign. Deep in the image, we see the bright white echoes of the transverse processes of the spine that I've highlighted in white. I've delineated the diaphragm in orange. The important point to note here is that the spine sign extends above the diaphragm. We would not expect to see this in normal lung because air-filled lung does not propagate ultrasound waves. In normal lung, the spine should end at the diaphragm. Because we can see the spine sign extending above the diaphragm, we know that it has to be fluid or pleural effusion allowing propagation of our ultrasound waves to the spine. Here's another example of a large pleural effusion. And here's an example of a smaller effusion with atelectatic lung above it. There's a general idea that these lung ultrasound findings exist on a spectrum from dry to wet, and that the sonographic image you see will reflect the air to fluid ratio in the lung. Let's move on to our second objective, lung ultrasound findings in COVID. Here are chest x-rays of a couple of patients I've seen recently that needed admission for COVID. They both have an appearance of patchy interstitial infiltrates affecting both lungs. And here's the CT scan of a patient with COVID demonstrating ground glass opacities and intralobular thickening. Understanding these radiographic findings will help us better understand the appearance of COVID on lung ultrasound. However, keep in mind this is a topic with minimal evidence at this point in time. 
current evidence base is a small number of papers, which include a study, two letters, and a, case, a couple of case reports. This descriptive study by Huang looked at 20 patients with COVID and provided minimal data about their clinical outcomes. Tang published a short letter describing long findings of COVID in 20 patients without any clinical data. Here's a letter by Poggiali describing the stenographic pathology of 12 patients with COVID. One Senso published a case report of one patient with ultrasound images of their patient's lungs. And here's a case report by one of my ICU colleagues, Adam Thomas, demonstrating lung ultrasound findings of a woman with COVID. So this is definitely a space to keep your eye on, as I'm sure more studies will be published to most likely confirm these findings. Lung ultrasound findings that have been described thus far include abnormalities of the pleura. Patients can get irregularity of the pleural line, as this example demonstrates, or thickening of the pleural line. Here's another clip of pleural irregularity and thickening. Other pleural-based abnormalities include the development of subpleural consolidations, like this example highlighted in orange. Or in this example of a slightly larger subpleural consolidation. Patients can also develop B lines, like these two examples demonstrate. B lines can take on many different appearances depending on progression of disease. They can appear focally, they can be multifocal, often with spared areas in between called skip lesions, and they can become confluent. The theory is that with further progression, confluent B lines can develop into frank consolidations. And here's an example of a consolidation in a patient with COVID. The tissue-like density is above the diaphragm, so we know it's consolidation instead of a solid organ. The Huang paper does a great job of correlating CT images with ultrasound findings. For example, these pleural-based lesions on CT correspond to the pleural irregularity and thickening we see on ultrasound. Ground glass opacities on CT correspond to the B lines we see on ultrasound. The most commonly affected lung fields are posterior and inferior, so these will be the highest yield zones to scan. These patients will almost never have findings in the anterior zones of the chest. Furthermore, pleural effusions, especially large pleural effusions, are rare. If you see a large pleural effusion, this decreases the likelihood that your patient has COVID. Of interest, the Chinese papers describe a temporal evolution of these ultrasound findings, whereas the patient recovers, a line should reappear. The last point about lung ultrasound to remember is that intrapulmonary and apical pathology will not be visualized by the probe. Lung ultrasound is very effective for pleural-based lesions or consolidations that extend to the pleura, but it unfortunately can't visualize deep intrapulmonary lesions. Before we talk about how we should be using lung ultrasound clinically, we need to talk about infection control. This is important, not just for you, but also for your clinical team and your clinical department. You need to ensure your safety and your team's safety first. If you plan on scanning any patients with COVID or suspected COVID, make sure you and your team are wearing appropriate personal protective equipment. You want to do everything you can to prevent your ultrasound machine from becoming a possible vector for the transmission of COVID. I'm sure most everyone has seen this New England Journal of Medicine study where the authors assess the stability of COVID on different surfaces. Viable virus was found up to four hours on copper, 24 hours on cardboard, and 72 hours on plastic and stainless steel. That's why it's so important to be systematic with your infection control measures. If your department has the ability, think about designating a machine or machines as COVID specific. Handheld devices should preferentially be used over a cart-based machine, as handhelds can be completely encased in a cover, are easier to clean, and don't have a cooling fan. If you're planning on using a cart-based ultrasound, use one with a touch screen instead of one with multiple knobs and buttons. You can imagine if you're in a room where an aerosol generating procedure is taking place, viral particles could find their way into all the crevices of the machine. Remove all unnecessary items from the cart like printers, baskets, and extraneous cords. It's ideal to scan these patients using a machine's battery power rather than plugging in into a wall outlet. You should utilize single-use gel packets instead of bottles. A bottle of gel is too high risk from an infection transmission standpoint. 
If you don't have single-use gel packets, here's a hack where you can make your own single-use gel dispensers with 10cc syringes. If you're planning on scanning in a patient room where aerosol generating medical procedures are taking place, consider covering your machine and your probes and cords in plastic. It's challenging with cart-based machines, so this speaks to how much easier handheld devices are to manage. A handheld can easily be placed in a plastic sandwich bag, as can your smartphone. Once you've completed your scan, make sure that you clean your gloved hands with hand sanitizer. Then remove any cover you have on your machine, taking care not to disperse viral contaminant and wipe it down with an appropriate disinfectant. Health Canada maintains a list of disinfectants that are effective against COVID, as does the United States Environmental Protection Agency. Most ultrasound manufacturers are waiving rules about machine-specific disinfectants and will support the use of any product effective against COVID. But it's always helpful to double check with your machine manufacturer. Pay attention to your product's kill time. This is the amount of wet time that your disinfectant needs to be on your machine surfaces for the disinfectant to be adequately effective. Ensure that your department has a standardized infection control workflow so that everyone is on the same page and following the same protocol. The Canadian Association of Emergency Physicians Emergency Ultrasound Committee has published an infection control protocol that is freely available online. The Canadian Point of Care Ultrasound Society has protocols for both cart-based units and handhelds. The American College of Emergency Physicians Emergency Ultrasound Section has created a one-page protocol. And the Emergency Ultrasound Team at Denver Health Medical Center has created a great infographic describing an appropriate infection control workflow. The machine should be cleaned both in the patient room immediately after use and outside the room after removing your personal protective equipment. Finally, before you take the machine into the room, ask yourself, do I have a clinical question that ultrasound can provide a useful answer to? Do I need to do a procedure that is safer with ultrasound guidance? If your answer is no to these questions, then don't scan the patient. This is not the time to be doing practice scans or scanning just for fun. Finally, let's talk about how we apply lung ultrasound to the current COVID pandemic, or if we even should. Screening is an area of major interest. Medscape News published an article on March 24th about an approach by Giovanni Volpicelli, an Italian lung ultrasound expert. He describes using lung ultrasound as a screening tool. So he will scan a patient. If the lung ultrasound is negative, meaning that the patient has A lines with no pleural abnormalities, B lines, or consolidation, he will order a swab for PCR and discharge the patient home. If the lung ultrasound is positive or suggestive of COVID, he will order a chest x-ray, labs, a swab for PCR, and you will admit the patient to an observation unit for 24 to 36 hours while he waits for test results to come back. However, let's keep in mind that screening is very much context dependent and location specific. For example, if you're screening an overwhelming number of patients in a tent with no other resources, maybe it makes sense to use the lung ultrasound. But I've also heard of outdoor screening tents that only use clinical assessment based on work of breathing, vital signs, and pulse oximetry to determine patient disposition. For example, this is what we're doing in Vancouver, Canada. This algorithm applies to us in the emergency department and to any screening centers we have in the city. Clinically, if the patient looks well, their vital signs are relatively normal, their oxygen saturation looks okay, these patients get discharged and instructed to self-isolate for two weeks. We don't have enough swabs or reagent or testing capacity to test everyone, so anyone that presents with a respiratory illness or flu-like illness is assumed to have COVID. Further testing like chest x-ray and labs are at the discretion of the treating physician. For patients that appear clinically unwell, these patients are tested with chest x-ray labs and a swab for PCR, and they're admitted to either the ward or the ICU depending on how sick they are. In my opinion, lung ultrasound doesn't really change what we do for patients in this algorithm especially because it doesn't appear as if findings on lung ultrasound necessarily predict a patient's clinical course. At the end of the day, I think screening should be performed according to your local public health guidelines. Let's talk about diagnosis. When Senso wrote an opinion piece in Lancet Respiratory Medicine called Less Stethoscope, More Ultrasound, where he said, in our opinion, the use of ultrasound is now essential in the safe management of the COVID-19 outbreaks since it 
since it can allow concomitant clinical examination and lung imaging at the bedside by the same doctor. Ultrasound is without question a far better diagnostic tool than a stethoscope. And we have to still be good clinicians and keep our differential open. Ultrasound can help with assessing other etiologies of dyspnea, like pericardial effusion or submassive PE. However, it is important to keep in mind that no imaging test, be it chest x-ray, CT, or ultrasound, is diagnostic for COVID. The issue here is that the test characteristics for lung ultrasound for COVID, in terms of sensitivity and specificity, have not been determined yet. Chest x-ray is poorly sensitive. Guan's study in the New England Journal of Medicine looked at almost 1,100 patients with COVID. 274 of these patients had initial chest x-ray, and only 59% of these demonstrated abnormalities. There has been significant interest in China in the utility of CT for COVID, partly because chest x-ray performs so poorly, and PCR is an imperfect test. This retrospective study by Fang looked at 51 patients at their institution who underwent CT and PCR testing for COVID within a three-day time period or less, and who had an eventual confirmed diagnosis of COVID by PCR testing. They found that CT had a sensitivity of 98% for COVID in their cohort of patients, while initial PCR testing only had a sensitivity of 71%. This seems to be consistent with the quoted sensitivity of initial PCR testing being in the 60 to 70% range, especially if you test early in the course of illness. She retrospectively looked at a group of 81 COVID patients who underwent CT to identify the most common radiographic findings in COVID. All the patients in this group had CT abnormalities. Lesions commonly occurred in both lungs in 79% of patients, and more than half of their study patients had peripheral-based lesions. Pathophysiologically, COVID seems to initially damage the alveoli, which causes alveolar edema and inflammation. This seems to explain why the majority of patients present with peripheral-based pathology. Ground glass opacities were the most common CT finding, occurring in 65% of patients. So here's an example of a CT of a patient with COVID, and we can see a couple of characteristics here. We can see that there's bilateral lung involvement, there's a mix of ground glass opacities and denser consolidation, and the lesions are mostly peripherally based. So does this mean we should CT all our patients? Should we be using CT as a screening test for COVID? The Canadian Association of Radiologists and the Canadian Society of Thoracic Radiology published a position statement where they recommend against the use of routine chest CT for screening diagnosis and surveillance of COVID-19. The American College of Radiology similarly published recommendations where they said CT should not be used to screen for or as a first-line test to diagnose COVID-19. The consensus by North American Radiology Specialist Societies is that CT shouldn't be used as a routine test for these patients. For one, if you send a known COVID or suspected COVID patient to CT, it takes anywhere from 30 minutes to two hours, depending on your institution, to properly clean and disinfect the scanner for the next patient. Second, you're exposing a lot of other healthcare workers to the patient, including the porter, possibly a nurse, and the CT tech. Third, you're taking a valuable resource that may be needed more urgently for another patient who is having a stroke or an aortic dissection or is in a high mechanism trauma. So this is where ultrasound steps in. Extrapolating from the COVID CT studies that are in the literature, lung ultrasound sensitivity is likely better than PCR testing. It's also likely better than chest x-ray. Again, this hasn't been formally studied, but this is extrapolation from the CT data. As I mentioned earlier, the majority of patients have peripheral-based lung pathology, which is where ultrasound performs best. In a patient with respiratory failure, a normal lung ultrasound likely rules out COVID, and you should search for another cause of your patient's respiratory failure. But also, remember that lung ultrasound findings are not necessarily specific to COVID. For example, TESTA describes their group's experience with using lung ultrasound for patients with H1N1, and they discovered very similar findings, like B lines, pleural irregularity, and subpleural consolidations. These findings are all consistent with viral pneumonia. Also, remember my earlier point that B lines are an artifact representing thickening of the interlobular septa. 
As such, you have to remember that B lines have a differential, which includes other pathology like pulmonary edema, pneumonitis, pulmonary fibrosis, interstitial lung disease, and ARDS. One clue to help distinguish between COVID versus pulmonary edema is to look carefully at the pleural line. This is an example from an Italian physician, Marco Garone. The clip on the left demonstrates a pleural line that's irregular, and that's in a patient with COVID, while the clip on the right has a nice smooth pleural line, which is in a patient with CHF. Lastly, let's talk about monitoring. This is probably where lung ultrasound will be most helpful. It's portable, can be performed at the bedside, it's repeatable, and it minimizes the need for transferring the patient. The Italian group for the evaluation of interventions in intensive care medicine has published three YouTube video conferences on their website where members share their clinical experience in managing COVID. Based on their anecdotal experience, they have found that patients with diffuse B lines usually respond to positive end expiratory pressure and that patients with denser posterior and inferior consolidation seem to respond to prone positioning for ventilation. Remember that at the end of the day, ultrasound is a tool and provides one additional data point to your clinical picture. Treat the patient and not the picture. What we know based on Yale Tung Chen's experience is that sonographic findings can evolve over time and can persist even after the course of illness is resolved. For example, on day four, he had some pleural irregularity and a B, occasional B line. On day eight, he had fairly dense B lines. He continued to have B lines on day 14, where he should have technically been through his illness. Even though he was negative on repeat PCR testing, he had still had some pleural irregularity on day 20. This is clearly a rapidly evolving space, and we need more data and more evidence. In fact, a colleague of mine recently described to me a possible therapeutic use for lung ultrasound a couple of days ago. Pre-intubation, he scans both lungs, and he'll place a wedge under the chest that looks worse so that the good lung is angled downward. Anecdotally, he has found that this improves his patient's pre-intubation oxygen saturation. Again, we need more evidence. There are a couple of examples of freely accessible online sites like ZEDU Training Solutions, the Society of Point of Care Ultrasound, and the POCUS Atlas. These sites are regularly updated as new evidence about lung ultrasound and COVID comes out. In summary, we started off with lung ultrasound basics. I'd recommend the 12 zone scanning technique looking at six zones per chest. We talked about starting your assessment at the pleura and then looking deeper into the lung to see if you can identify pathology like B lines or consolidation. We reviewed common sonographic findings of COVID, which include pleural irregularity and thickening, subpleural consolidations, B lines in a variety of different patterns from focal to multifocal to confluent, and frank consolidation. Remember that pathology is most commonly found posteriorly and inferiorly, and large pleural effusions are rare in COVID. We reinforce the importance of infection control, not just for your own safety, but for the safety of your team, your other patients, and your department. Make sure that you have a clear protocol for which machine to use, how to use it safely, and how to clean it appropriately after scanning. And we finish by attempting to figure out how to integrate lung ultrasound into your clinical practice. Screening for COVID is going to be very much context specific and location dependent. And most screening programs I've heard about assess patients using vitals, pulse oximetry, and clinical assessment. From a diagnosis standpoint, ultrasound is extremely helpful in assessing other etiologies of dyspnea. However, no imaging test is diagnostic for COVID. Lung ultrasound may very well have similar sensitivity to CT for COVID, but this hasn't been confirmed yet. At this point in time, I think it's reasonable to use lung ultrasound instead of CT as it will minimize exposure to other healthcare workers and free up the CT scanner for other patients who actually require urgent CT imaging. However, I believe you also only want to use point of care ultrasound if you have a specific clinical question that you need an answer to, or if you have a procedure that you need to perform more safely. Lastly, ultrasound is probably most helpful from a monitoring standpoint as it can easily be repeated daily. Italian intensivists have anecdotally found that patients with diffuse B lines seem to improve with PEEP, and patients with consolidation or atelectasis posteriorly and inferiorly seem to improve with prone positioning. Remember that at the end of the day, ultrasound is an additional tool in your toolbox. Treat the patient and not the picture. This is a rapidly evolving space, so pay attention to it. Feel free to contact me via email or Twitter.